Thank you, Brother John. Good morning, Hickory Knoll, and Happy New Year to you. The word this morning is renewal. Renewal. And we're going to look at a number of passages in the Scripture that uses that, that theme or that concept or the very word. Let's start in the book of Titus. We're looking at uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Notice that word, renewing. Because, again, that's our, that's our theme today. That's what we're talking about. Yes, we'll be talking about New Year's resolutions to some extent because, well, that's, it's the time of the year when we do that sort of thing. And so we're going to be considering some New Year's resolutions. Um, some of them are humorous. I, I, uh, I have one here. I think that uh, you might. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yeah, here it is. <clears throat> My problem is I have too much material. You ever had that problem? Um, here's what one person says. He says, first, I'm going to learn what resolution means. I think sometimes that uh, we, we live as if we don't actually know what a res- resolution is or what it means. He says, uh, he resolves to always, or maybe this is a she, this is off the internet, as you can imagine, uh, resolve to always replace the gas nozzle before driving away from the pump. That's a good one. Um, I resolve to keep an extra safe distance between, uh, well, when driving behind police cars. Yeah, that's, that's important. I resolve to remember to brush teeth with the bristly end of the toothbrush. That's important. And there are many others. What kind of resolutions do you plan to make? And are you in the process of making? You know, when the scripture talks about renewal, um, it, it carries with it the concept of starting over again. I saw a movie once, a long time ago, but I'll never forget it. Not because the movie was all that terrific, but because of the title of the movie. The movie was about a man by the name of Finnegan. Finnegan. And the title of the movie was Finnegan Begin Again. Finnegan Begin Again. And it's about a man who's starting over in his life. And he thought his life was just about over, that he had nothing to live for, as I recall the movie. He had lost his uh, zest for life. He uh, had just kind of thrown in the towel and given up and decided to just exist day by day. But then certain events happen in his life, and he starts thinking about the prospect and even wondering if it's possible for him, this man named Finnegan, to begin again. And surely enough, as movies go, he found someone And he found something to live for and some reason to have new, renewed enthusiasm and renewed life. Well, people are always beginning again. Every winter, if you watch the least bit of television news, you're going to see reports about tornadoes or other kinds of storms, floods, as we well know about in this area, or house fires. And then the TV crew goes out there and they interview the family. And the family is fortunate enough to have survived with their, you know, uninjured and all. Then you find them looking around for whatever it is they can salvage. And right away, they start making plans, at least, to start anew. Maybe it's to build another house or to repair the one they lost or whatever. But it's a, it's a new beginning. That's happened to the city of Jerusalem several times in its history. As a matter of fact, 
When you go to the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, the book of Lamentation is about the lamenting uh, or the mourning over the loss or the destruction of Jerusalem. And the Babylonians, in uh, some 500 years before uh, the Lord Jesus was born, came in there and utterly destroyed Jerusalem. And again, that's what the book of Lamentations is about, is about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the sorrow uh, that the people of Jerusalem felt because their city had been destroyed. And in the last verse in the book of Lamentations, verse 21 and 22 actually, verse chapter 5, here's what the scripture says. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew, there's that word again, renew our days as of old. We always say that there's no future in the past. And to try to find a future in the past is kind of like driving down a busy street with your eyes on the rear view mirror. It's dangerous, isn't it? And so the scripture says that and teaches in many ways that we are to be people who, yes, we learn from the past. We learn from the uh, the mistakes we made and the pain they caused. I was telling someone today, I, I chose to walk down that front walkway. And if you, if you came up here and looked closely at my shoes, you would find that they're, even though I very carefully shined them and cleaned them this morning, so you wouldn't be ashamed of your preacher up here walking around on the platform. But I chose to walk down that walkway and I didn't realize that there's about an inch and a half of water standing on that sidewalk out front. Now, I realized after I got about halfway down, and it was just as close to come onto the front door as it was to turn around and go back. But I've learned from a mistake. That's what I told some of the men out in the the hall. I said, that was a mistake. But I've learned my lesson. I've learned the next time it's been raining quite a lot, like it was last night, that I'm going to come in the other door. You see, because I learned. Now, mistakes are okay as long as you learn from them. Because uh, it's, uh, the tuition sometimes can be expensive, but all the benefits from looking at what you just learned and then saying, now, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to do better in my life. I'm going to look forward. I'm not going to just constantly mourn over the past, but I'm going to do something new and Different. Let's go to the book of Philippians. This is Philippians chapter 3. And the scripture says here that there's no future in the past. Uh, that you've got to learn to look forward. Verse 13, Philippians 3. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. That means don't rest on your laurels. That means don't just be so proud of what you have done, that you forget to keep on moving forward. So he says, I don't count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, that's called prioritizing your life. And finding the most important things and concentrating on those first. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are ahead. Or rather, I'm sorry, uh, forgetting... Those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Notice that. That's the approach on life. Forgetting those things which are behind. Now again, he's not talking about forgetting the lessons we learned. He's talking about forgetting the pain. It means moving on in your life. It means forgetting um, whatever difficulties that uh, you have experienced And saying, but what do I do now? What do I do with the rest of my life? Are you glad 2007 is just about over? Are you ready to put it to rest? I don't know about you. Um, I've had a a pretty decent year, I guess you could say. 
But there have been some years in my life uh, that were very, very tough. Tough. I can tell you about them. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy the year 2000 because that's the year, November 17th, that my uh, uh, less than two-year-old grandson was diagnosed with leukemia. That was a tough year for our family and the, and the ensuing three years after that. I didn't enjoy 1989. And there are reasons for that. But, uh, and, and basically, I can tell you what they were. Our founding president of Heritage Christian University was, uh, was getting more, his health was getting worse and worse day by day. He had cancer, he had heart problems, he had diverticulitis, he had uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and other problems. And the future of our university was not threatened, but it was just in limbo. And I was vice president. And I was having to carry the burden of being the leader, even though I didn't have the, uh, the uh, title, the authority, you might say the clout. It was a very stressful year for me. 1983 was a tough year for me. I was glad when it was over. I'm telling you these stories because more than likely you can relate. There have been some years in your life, maybe not 2007, but maybe there have been some, but maybe 2007 has been a tough one for you. And you're glad it's over. You're ready for a new year. In 1983, I absolutely was in over my head uh, with responsibilities. I had taken on too much. And I can tell you about that some other time. But I had too many jobs, too many responsibilities. I had not learned to say no. I hadn't even learned to say, let me think about it, or let's wait a while. I would just say yes to anything that came along. Any opportunity, especially if it was uh, 15 uh, to 20 days on out in the future, you know, that seemed like it was very possible to me. Um, And so I went to my doctor, and I said, Doc, I feel rotten. He said, okay. And he started asking me questions, and after a while, he said, you're depressed. I said, no, I'm just tired. He said, no, you're depressed. And then he started unraveling it for me. And he said, you feel guilty because you've taken on all these things and you can't do any of them as well as you feel like you should. And as a result of that, uh, you're depressed. He said, I know because I've been the same way. He said, I'm just now coming out of mine. He said, I had to give up some things. I had to stop doing some things. And so... I was glad when 1983 was over. I said, goodbye and good riddance. How about you? Have you had a year like that when you can just basically say, I'm glad this one is over. I'm ready for a new year. Paul says, I'm going to keep my eye on one thing in particular. And he said, I'm going to forget those things that are in the past. And I'm going to reach forward forward, reach forward to some good things in the future. I'm going to set myself some goals. I'm going to prioritize my life and I'm going to get my life together. I'm going to make some decisions. I'm going to make some choices. I'm going to make some resolutions and I'm going to stick to them. Jeff Kramer writes in the uh, Syracuse Post Standard that he's given up on um, on New Year's resolutions because he can't seem to keep them. So he has a new idea. Here's his new idea. Is to make some resolutions that he knows he can't keep. Alright, so what he's doing is he's, u- he's using reverse psychology on himself. He says, I resolved to gain 35 pounds or more in 2008. Now you see, he's hoping that he can't keep that resolution. You got that? That's reverse psychology. He says, I resolved to never push my heart rate above resting. Uh, I resolved to go ballistic every time someone cuts me off in traffic. I resolved to be impatient with anyone who delays me, regardless of their age or infirmity. I resolved to floss erratically, if at all. Um, I will not own my own behavior. I will keep talking even when no one is listening. So he's making himself some ridiculous resolutions. That way, he won't feel bad if he doesn't keep them. How about you? What kind of resolution are you thinking about? Here's one that a friend sent me by email. Um, 
This is a friend who lives in Dallas. Her name is Cleo. And she says, I resolve to be more patient. I resolve to be more understanding. I resolve to be more forgiving. I I resolve to listen better, especially to my preacher. She didn't say that, but I just threw threw that in. Um, I resolve to trust more in God and less in myself. I will work hard to curb anger. I will be more gentle and less abrasive. I will read and study my scriptures more, or these scriptures more. I will pray more. And then that's nine. And then number ten is, I will try to do what Philippians 4, 8 says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's Philippians 4. Verse 8, I would say that's a a pretty good list of New Year's resolutions. How about you? Let's think about this business of renewal. Um, When you think about renewal, you're thinking about this, this, this concept of to be as new again. Uh, Well, to begin again. Now, I want you to know that life is a process of starting over, time after time after time. Um, If you don't realize that, you're going to be constantly frustrated and disappointed with yourself because you will always disappoint yourself. And other people will disappoint you. And you will disappoint other people. And so we're constantly regrouping, getting our act together, And starting over. But if we learn, if we learn uh, from the mistakes we've just made and the mistakes we've made in the past, as well as the things we have done well and have done right, then our future can be brighter and better than our past. And Christians are people who must constantly be looking for a new and a better day. I like what Diana Ross said. Diana Ross, the lead singer of the Supremes back in the olden days, um, who now is a, is a sort of a, a, a retro star, and, and she had a, a sing, single career for a while. But I saw her interviewed one time uh, on one of these um, TV shows where they interview stars and they review some of their uh, past work and all that. And the question was asked to Diana Ross about a certain album that she said flopped. And the question was asked to her, when you produce an album and it doesn't sell, what does that do to you? And you know what Diana Ross said, the consummate professional entertainer, singer? She said, I say, next You got that? I say next. And what she's saying is the same thing that Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. I don't let an unfortunate incident or failure or some some disappointment in my past hold me down and hold me back. But instead, I say next. What's next? What's next around the corner? Lamar Plunkett. You don't know Lamar Plunkett. He passed away about five years ago. He was one of my teachers uh, back in uh, my college days. He was a brilliant Bible scholar and a very effective preacher. He was from Louisiana, by the way. Uh, Born and raised, he and his brother Bob, and they're now in Alabama, but... uh, don't remember exactly the town, but he, was, he, he grew up in Louisiana. But Lamar told a story about, a true story, about being in a hotel in Texas. Now, this was a long time ago. He was a young, virile preacher. He was in his room. He was there to conduct some big revival meeting in some town in Texas. And he was up there studying his Bible, working up his notes and all that. When the phone rings 
and it's the manager of the hotel. And the manager says, Mr. Plunkett, I understand that you are a minister. He said, well, yes, yes, I am. He said, we have a situation down here that I wonder if you would be willing to uh, consider helping us work out. He said, well, I don't know what is it. He said, well, we have this elderly couple here who came here to get married. It was on a Saturday evening. And the preacher, uh, the minister that they had uh, uh, asked to conduct their ceremony, for some reason has either forgotten it or he's, he hasn't shown up. We don't know where he is. We have, we're not able to get in touch with him. And I was wondering if, we were wondering if you would come down and conduct this wedding ceremony. Well, Brother Plunkett said he put on his tie and coat and took his Bible with him. And he goes down there and here's this elderly couple. And he sat down and visited with them a little bit and learned that both of them had lost their mates uh, years before. And they had found each other, fallen in love, and, and, uh, and wanted to get married. And here they were. They had all their license, everything together. Just no preacher. And so he agreed to conduct the wedding ceremony. He said it was one of the happiest experiences he'd ever had. And um, he said after it was over, the old man asked him, said, um, and don't do preachers this way, please. But the old man said, uh, well, how much do I owe you, son? And Brother Plunkett, of course, had been asked that question. Just give your preacher some money if you want him to have some, but don't ask him how much you owe him. That's not the way to treat a preacher. Um, but but he, he did the stock answer. He said, just pay me what she's worth to you. And he said that old man straightened up, squared his shoulders, looked at his new bride, stepped up to her, put his arms around her, and kissed her a long wet one, turned her loose and said, Son, there ain't that much money in the whole world. Well, what was he doing? He was starting all over. He said, we got a new beginning. we got a new life. Today is the first day of the rest of our lives. And we're moving forward. From this moment forward. He, and basically he was saying, son, you don't get any money, but boy, do I get me a valuable bride today. So Paul says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God and Christ Jesus. He said, I'm moving on up. I know that sounds like the Jefferson's theme song, but that's what he's saying. He says, I'm moving forward. I've, I've had some pain. I've had some disappointment in my life. But from this moment forward, my, my life is going to be better because I'm going to make better decisions. I'm going to make wiser choices. I'm going to remember some things I've learned from my mistakes. And I'm going to make my life better. Starting Today, the psalmist says in Psalm 118, verse 24, that today is the day that the Lord has made. And you know what else the Bible says about today? The scripture says, this is Hebrews 4, 7, today is the day of salvation. I forgot to notice what John planned to sing for an invitation song, but whether or not, uh, which, which one is it, sir? That's the one I thought you were going to sing. Let's review this song before we sing it. It goes like this. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He has the words of life. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He says and do what He wills. He is the living way. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me. Foes may beset me. Still, 
will I enter in. I will hasten, hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Well, that's the invitation song we're going to sing in just a moment. But let me encourage you to think about your life and where you are right now, where your life has been, but more importantly, where your life is going. And what kind of resolution you need to make today to make your future better than your past. And as we sing this song, of all the things you might be thinking about, uh, weight control, you may be thinking about more exercise, you may be thinking about uh, just just a, a number of things. You might set some goals and, and, and get a promotion or a raise and you're going to strive for these things. You may be thinking about being a better father, a better husband, a better mother, a better wife, a better son or daughter or parent. But remember that anything and everything that comes into your life which is good starts with putting the Lord first. Put Jesus first and all these other things will come into your life in the way uh, that you need them. And at the time, you need them. And God gives you strength when you put Him first. When He lives in your heart, then He can bless you, bless your, re- your resolutions and your decisions and your choices. And so, the song of encouragement right now, um, I am resolved, is to encourage anyone who needs to publicly display Resolve to put the Lord first, requesting prayers of the church for anyone who's not yet been baptized for remission of sin, to resolve to allow your soul to be saved, to, for, for Jesus to save your soul. As a believer, repenting of sin, confessing faith in Him, and receiving baptism, so that the innocent blood of Jesus Christ washes all those past sins away. And then you turn as a new person, being born anew, to a new day, and a new future with Him in the very center of your life. That's the resolution I'm calling on you to make today. With all other good ones you want to make, put the Lord first in your life. If you need to come to Him, come to Him now while together we stand and sing.